Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program we'll be discussing the plight of the persecuted church in the Middle East and how as Christians we need to stand with them, especially at Christmas. Warm welcome to this Christmas edition of the Middle East Report and have a special guest all the way from Dorset. He's a good friend of mine and of the Middle East Report and Revelation TV. Uh, none other than Tim Osmond, the UK ambassador for Help the Persecuted. Um, Tim, it's great to see you on the Middle East Report and of, of course love the work and the ministry that you're involved in in Help the Persecuted. And, and thank you so much for being here for this Christmas edition of the Middle East Report as we look at the persecuted church in the Middle East. Simon, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be here. Yeah. And um, Tim, uh, can you just share with us how vital uh, your ministry is, particularly in helping to assist and equip uh, persecuted Christians uh, in the Middle East? Well, as you know, Simon, you know, as soon as someone becomes persecuted for following Jesus, they end up on their own. And it's vital that we rescue them, which is, you know, first and foremost, we're ministers of the gospel, that rescue, restore and rebuild the lives of persecuted Christians. And so we rescue them from immediate danger, um, which is vital. So they're not left on their own. Um, as you know, most of the families want to kill them uh, throughout the Middle East. You know, as soon as they come into a relationship with Jesus and they say, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm following Jesus Christ now. This is the cost that they have to pay. You know, so it's vital that we're there as a support system you know, to start them on their journey and with any new Christian, whether that be, you know, in the West, but especially in the Middle East, they need discipling. So as soon as we can get them into a safe house, we can disciple them. And um, with persecution on the increase in the Middle East, it's God's command that we look after our brothers and sisters in Christ. And therefore we are looking after him. Amen. And do you want to give us some, an update? Because 2023 has been a very dramatic uh, year in, in the Middle East. And um, share with us the overview of Help the Persecuted and how they've been able to make uh, a, a huge difference in the lives of believers in the Middle East, as we know, particularly those that are suffering persecution. And the Middle East is the most darkest, dangerous region of the world as well. Sure. It's, you know, we didn't think for one moment coming out of 22 into 23, some of the things that we, we've seen before our eyes, you know, and heard on the news uh, that we've been directly involved with, you know, and the first one was the uh, Turkey-Syria earthquake. And throughout 23, we've been called into action for crisis response. Um, not something we were anticipating, but that's the way God wants us to help um, share the gospel across the Middle East. So the first one, Turkey and Syria. And as you know, in Turkey, um, the, most of the food, most of the aid got into Turkey, but nothing was getting into Syria. You know, Assad thought it was a political situation. Uh, the borders were closed. One, you know, the lorries were backed up, but we had a team in Syria, you know, so we were able to get money into them, resources, um, get them to look after people. Um, and then we could get a team in from Lebanon and also uh, uh, Jordan. Um, and then going further down, we've uh, a crisis in Lebanon, you know, where we, we built our farm. And then even further down, we had uh, the Morocco earthquake, uh, where we jumped into action with that. We had the Sudan conflict. Uh, so our team in Egypt helped uh, 5,000 people on the Egyptian uh, Sudan border. Um, and, um, and now with this war, you know, with Israel and Hamas and Hezbollah, we've had to take action in Lebanon, which we can talk about as well. So it's been a, a very, very eventful year, you know, and uh, we're now in December, 12 months later, um, and it's absolutely extraordinary how God is opening the doors and asking us and showing us where to go. Um, Pakistan 
we had our first member um, team member in Pakistan in July and then look what happened with the apostasy law so we were able to jump into action and now really good news we're just training up to help the persecuted members in Yemen so amazing. things have been happening amazing mm -hmm. so let's have a look at uh, the overall vision of uh, help the persecuted and this is looking back at four years of helping persecuted Christians in the Middle East over the past year, Christian Charity Help the Persecuted has provided vital humanitarian and spiritual support to more than 81,000 persecuted Christians in 13 countries largely hostile to the gospel. That's almost double the amount of lives they helped to rescue, restore and rebuild in the previous year. Help the Persecuted CEO and President Joshua Youssef brought this update from London highlighting how all this is possible through people standing with them in this important ministry. It was 2018 that we launched Help the Persecuted USA. Uh, the subsequent year, 2019, we launched Help the Persecuted United Kingdom. And I'm here in London uh, this summer celebrating four years that the Lord has so uh, wonderfully provided for this ministry, this organization. Uh, he's provided resources, supporters. He's provided great media opportunities. I've had an opportunity to be interviewed on radio and TV uh, and in print. And uh, the church here really is dedicated and devoted to learning more about the persecuted church. And this is what these Help the Persecuted Partners had to say about the importance of this work. Well, this is a vital ministry because we are told biblically to support our brothers and sisters facing persecution. And, uh, and as a, an expert in the Middle East, there is no more dangerous region in the world than the Middle East. Um, particularly if we see the devastation caused by ISIS, the persecution of Christians in Iran against the, by the Iranian regime. Um, and um, it's a sense to know that these Christians are not alone, that they're being supported, that there is an organisation behind them that cares for their practical, spiritual and emotional needs um, is very special. And as Christians, we need to do that more and more. I think it's very, very important at this time because persecution is increasing in, for, for Christians. And I think it's a terrible, terrible thing to prevent people to become Christians or to live their normal lives. And lots more people should hear about what happens and support them. I really like the whole idea of, of rescuing and redeeming and renewing. And the fact that they, they take an emergency situation and turn it into a long-term recovery and it's just so exciting for me to be here and uh, to be visiting with people who are passionate about um, praying for and supporting their persecuted brothers and sisters and so i just want to say you know thank you to help the persecuted united kingdom and to find out how you can partner with help the persecuted go to htp.org And it's uh, amazing to actually help uh, support the ministry that is Help the Persecuted, making such a difference uh, in the Middle East, as we know that this is the birthplace of, of Christianity. And um, Tim, um, would you just share with us some of the main challenges and, and threats facing the persecuted church uh, in the Middle East? I mean, you talked about the earthquakes uh, that have dominated uh, the region in 2023, but also the fact that you know there's all that political instability, there's there's wars um, and you know the Middle East is is not short of events at any at, in any time or any dates. Well, where do we start? <laughs> we can go to Syria, we can go to the earthquake um, and that's you know um, it was a vital piece of support that we're able to give um, this particular church in Aleppo uh, with our team and we've got three team members full-time now in Aleppo um, in the north, it's, you know, we've got four um, terrorist organisations, jihadists up there in the north. And so it's very difficult. None of our team, our Western team, could get into Syria. So it was only the team that we had there and our Jordanian team and the Lebanese team that could go in. When no other um, organisation or charity could get into Syria, doors were closed. You know, we, we were there and it's so vitally important to have those teams on the ground. Um, 
If we go into uh, Iran as well, we've got two team members in Iran now. Um, we took on our second one this year. Uh, so that's another increase that the Lord has shown us and opened the doors for in Iran, which is, is um, it's, it's perilous times in Iran, as you know, you know, who are fighting these proxy wars, you know, and so for Christians, it's so dangerous. As soon as they find out there's a Christian, then they, they're persecuted and put in jail. Um, uh, Pakistan, you know, the, the apostasy laws in Pakistan are very, very bad for Christians because it seems to me that, you know, you could do anything. Uh, you can bump someone in the car or in the street and they'll, they'll say you've, you've, you know, you've, cr you've created an apostasy um, and then you, you come under persecution and you can get put into jail. Uh, right down into Yemen, uh, right through North Africa. We've got so many people in North Africa, uh, in Algeria, in Morocco, in Algeria, um, uh, Tunisia and Egypt. You know, it's perilous for them. You know, um, we have prayer reports that come out every single week. Um, and these guys, I mean, they never cease to amaze us that they will stand firm and they're willing to lose everything. Lebanon, you know, a country that's in huge crisis. Um, you know, they've they had the port explosion. They've had COVID. They've now had the, um, the uh, Lebanese lira that's been devalued by about 400%. Um, they're, they're in poverty, they can't afford to eat, you know. So it's happening everywhere and this is where we're being able to help so much, not only with practical support, but the most important thing is the gospel. Absolutely. Um, and it's, you know, it's to help a persecuted church throughout the Middle East and in these hostile nations that we want to see the church supported and the church to grow. Um, where they are, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing an increase in persecution, but God is working miracles throughout the Middle East. And Tim, um, going back to uh, Pakistan, for example, share why it's particularly difficult uh, for all Christians in Pakistan and how situation facing Christians in Pakistan is very different from Christians uh, across the Middle East. Well, I think Pakistan is um, uh, a, cu a country which as I said before, they have this apostasy law uh, that it only takes uh, for someone to raise an alarm um, and the authorities don't do anything about it. You know, so Christians are on their own. And as we saw, you know, with those churches that were burnt down and homes that were ransacked just because some people got accused of desecrating the Quran. Um, and it was like mob violence everywhere on the, on the hearsay of you know, a couple of people. So it's, it's so dangerous for people there. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure how that's going to change uh, within that uh, country. There needs to be a big spiritual awakening. Um, God needs to move in a big way. And I'm sure he is, you know, but we've only just started with that. Absolutely. So let's have a look at uh, the situation facing Christians in Pakistan. And uh, this excellent news report is on courtesy of Help the Persecuted. Christians in several communities in Pakistan have come under attack from angry mobs after two teenagers were accused of allegedly desecrating a Quran. Christian leaders and others said it was a false accusation. In response, Christian charity helped the persecuted as a field ministry team on the ground in the worst affected areas around Faisalabad, providing immediate practical and spiritual support. Here, team member Pastor Rashid is stood on one of the most impacted streets, describing the devastation in this Christian community. I am looking at the situation here in front of me, uh, really bad situation, and as a part of the body of Christ, I can uh, feel the pain. So, so please pray for us and pray for our brother and sister who are living here. Uh, they lost everything. They have no place to live. He went on to visit one of the homes of a Christian whose home had not only been vandalized but also burgled. Who is she in Six month old daughter. Um, she had a gold ring as a gift. They stole and they stole all the gold from their house. You can Safety see home. his house is totally destroyed and they snatch everything Safety from the home. home and they are not safe here. Pastor Rashid was able to provide lightning funds to assist 80 people with their immediate needs for food and shelter. 
So our little support uh, when we gave them, they were smiling like they have uh, a lot of uh, money. And when they took the uh, cash support, like uh, relief from us, they were giving lots of prayers and they were asking, where come from this money? So I said them, it is from God. So they were very happy. And help the persecuted CEO and President Joshua Youssef says they're committed to helping rebuild these many broken lives in Pakistan. This type of event is going to require a, a larger response on our part, both in terms of rebuilding, uh, but also uh, a, a sort of spiritual and, and you know counseling uh, component as well. And we need to be praying for these people who are experiencing a host of emotions, I'm sure, and uh, that they would uh, be given peace in the midst of this, peace in the midst of this chaos, uh, but also, um, you know, some resolve. I think I think things need to change in Pakistan, and perhaps this is a, a turning point. Peter Wedding reporting for the Global News Alliance. And it's so important, uh, often we forget about Christians in Pakistan to continue to keep them in our prayer and particularly to kind of remember them at uh, Christmas because some of the worst levels of persecution against Christians is actually happening in Pakistan. Um, Tim, just share with us how Help the Persecuted is helping to rebuild broken lives and communities um, in Pakistan. And I can imagine it's not an easy country to actually operate and work in. No, not at all. Um, as I said, we, the Lord led us into Pakistan and uh, we had our first field team member, um, you know, working for Help the Persecuted, which came on board in June, July. And then shortly after that, we had the attack. Um, he was able to travel with the team um, about three hours drive away to the scene of the attack and actually immediately help 82 people. Um, they were just absolutely shocked. You know, uh, they were heartbroken as to the devastation uh, that had been caused. They'd lost everything. Um, and so we were able to identify, I think they had to use quite a lot of wisdom and prayer to identify those families we needed to help immediately because of the chaos. And um, the families were just so overwhelmed. They just wanted to know where the support came from. And they were told it comes from God this support, you know, and um, they just broke down. So, you know, bit by bit, we're supporting the communities by having a team there on the ground. And it's so vitally important to have indigenous people there, not Westerners coming in, but indigenous people speak the language. They understand how they can share the gospel with people that have had their lives shattered you know, Christians that had their lives shattered, and also those perhaps that want to understand, you know, but it's obviously perilous. And so it's, it's built, rebuilding communities, rebuilding churches, coming alongside them to let them know there is support there for them, and then on their own. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, this year, the, the Middle East was hit by a devastating earthquake. So we've taken the first earthquake that hit uh, both Turkey and Syria mm -hmm. uh, with a magnitude of 7.8 on the Richter scale. Mm -hmm. And this occurred on February the 6th of, uh, sorry, February the 6th, 2023 at 4.17 in the morning um, and it's believed that this resulted in the death of over 59,000 people died mm. with 121,000. Uh, just share with us how Help the Persecuted has managed to respond to this absolute devastating earthquake that uh, shook both Turkey and Syria to its core. Well I mentioned before that you know Turkey had all the aid going in but it wasn't allowed to really go into Syria so they suffered greatly. You know, but because we had the team in Aleppo, we're able to put funds straight into them and get them to support wherever they needed uh, the help to be. Um, and you had, you had these Syrians uh, who were sleeping in makeshift tents outside in minus four. They were too frightened to go back into their homes. They were sleeping in their cars. Um, and so we, there was a, a, a building, a, a school building next to the church that we, we set up in and we just gave out whatever we could, uh, blankets and, and hot food, and help support prayer. And obviously it's traumatic. You know, they've had, what, up to 15 years of in, internal war. Um, and this is just like topping it all off. 
You know, it's, they, they, I don't know, some of them just can't carry on. It's just too much for them. So we were able to support with our emergency relief kits, which are food parcels. Um, and now over there, the team is still there. Uh, they've been helping to rebuild, or should I say repair, homes so people could go back to them. Um, looking after the children, uh, doing children's events, children's um, little camps basically, and looking after them and sharing the love of Jesus with them. Um, and with the elderly, uh, the, the most important support, you know, is to, to look after them, to give them trauma counselling, food, blankets, you know, every, anything they need uh, to help them get through this. And it's winter there and it's really, really cold, you know, so this will come into our winter relief programme. So just share with us some, Tim, for example, I mean, like, I mean, it's, it's when we hear stories like this, the, the magnitude of this earthquake, I mean, 7.8 on mm. the Richter scale is huge. The number of deaths is absolutely uh, beyond comprehension. But how, how do you respond to these things? What well, suddenly decision to say, look, we need to, uh, you know, help these people. But, but even that, thinking what to do in these situations, knowing it's very, very difficult for Christians to get into Turkey, let alone mm. get into Syria itself, which is a kind of war-torn country that has been ravaged by a civil war now for well over a decade. Well, I think, you know, it goes back to uh, help the persecuted when we uh, had the ISIS crisis, you know, and we had to jump into action there um, and support families that were fleeing ISIS. So it's, it's become part of our DNA. And because we had a team in Aleppo, um, we, we were able to help immediately. Uh, it wasn't something that we had to have a meeting about. I think it was just really, we need, these guys need help quickly. No one's getting in. And we saw on the news how, I think with Turkey, within that first week, they uncovered so many bodies just within week one, you know, alive that were under the rubble. Whereas in Syria, you couldn't do that because there wasn't the help. There wasn't the infrastructure. There wasn't the machinery there. You know, nothing could get in, so that's why the death toll was so much higher. And also the buildings were, you know, in a, in a state of collapse as well. But not only that is, we were able to get t a team in from Lebanon, straight across the border into Syria. You know, a team in from Jordan, as I said before, via Damascus, down into, into Aleppo. And even when they were there, there were tremors and they thought there was going to be more earthquakes happening. So it was very frightening for them. But as the weeks and months have gone on, you know, our teams have been able to stay and help as much as they can within the area and they're still there. So support is still going into Syria uh, right now, although we won't hear about it on the news anymore. So let's have a look at this uh, news video produced by Help the Persecuted that looks into how the ministry is helping the long term effects of those hit by the devastating earthquake that hit both Turkey and Syria back in February. As a colossal earthquake rocked the Syria-Turkey border in February 2023, Christian charity Help the Persecuted has provided practical and spiritual support to more than 12,000 people impacted by the disaster. Immediately after the earthquake struck, their field ministry team provided heating, shelter, warm clothing and bedding. They've served across Syria from Aleppo to Aladakia, distributing hundreds of emergency relief kits filled with meat, eggs and fresh produce to persecuted families left devastated by the earthquake. The charity also provided hygiene supplies as well as laundry and shower facilities. Help the Persecuted has also coordinated several children's programs, including providing winter coats as well as support for special needs children and persecuted youth who've known nothing other than war and disaster. For the first time in a long time they get to be kids, playing water games, eating snacks and encountering gospel hope. And they've provided temporary safe accommodation and home repairs for those left displaced by earthquake damage. These people shared their extreme gratitude for the vital help they've received. I 
عم تعطوا بالمكان المناسب تساعدوا هالناس الموجوده الناس التعبانه الناس اللي بالفعل هي محتاجه شكرا لكم شكرا لتعبكم معنا كل ياتكم والله انا بنبسط كثير من جماعه اللي عم بتفرعوا للعالم هدول وبيساعدوهم يعني انا بتشكرهم كثير كثير وكثر خيرهم الله يعطيهم الف عافيه ونحن بجهودنا عم نشتغل من اسس لهم العالم نصلح لهم بيوتهم حتى ما كل واحد عم ببرك بيته خايف طول ما له بيرق خايف على هلا بدل علي شقه بتزرقها وهلا بدل علي الحيط ما نحن عم نزرق لهم ونصلح لهم اللي بنقدر نصلحه اللي بنقدر عليه كلياته عم نسويه بنصلح لهم الجماعه وكثر خير كثير انا بتشكر كثير كثير اللي عم يساعدوا العالم and help the persecutors will continue to stand with the persecuted Christians of Syria facing such ongoing hardship. And to find out more, go to htp.org. And I think we can see from that excellent uh, news report produced by Help the Persecuted um, how lives need to be rebuilt, how homes need to be rebuilt, and particularly for Christians caught up uh, in this situation, how they're constant how we need to constantly pray for them but also show them that practical love and support as christians particularly in the devastation that we see in syria after being ravaged by a war that's lasted over a decade uh, and tim i mean it's one thing for the middle east uh, to hit with one huge earthquake but there's but it's something else when we see that in north africa still in the middle east uh, morocco uh, was hit on the 8th of september 2023 uh, where more than 2900 people died and more than 5500 were actually injured yeah yeah that was interesting i mean oh another devastation it's it's actually one earthquake after another isn't it um and interestingly i was out in um jordan um at the time in the middle east with marika we were just uh spending time with the team when the call came in from our uh, help the persecuted team member in in morocco um and he had already been out uh, he had taken a group of people with him um, they'd gone out to the areas that were devastated. Um, some of them, the roads that were going up into the Atlas Mountains were impassable. So they had, some of it had, they, had to go on foot uh, to actually make an assessment, to find out what people needed, you know. And um, as you can see, you know, the homes were just completely destroyed. So they came back and I remember sitting there with a conversation with him and, he, and they said, what do you need? Okay, well, we need, we need tents. You know, it's in the Atlas Mountains and the harsh weather, the cold weather is just about to come. Uh, we need tents, we need food, we need blankets, uh, we need uh, um, water, we need all those medical things as well. So we, we arranged a budget, they're called lightning funds, you know, we instantly, we said, <laughs> yeah, right, okay, go and do it. So the guys went off and they, they, um, they had a truckload of items which they then took up and they started building these tents and and if you can see them i mean they're kind of open at one end and uh whilst they may protect people from the rain it's not really going to keep a lot of the cold out you know so um you'll see people with just a, a mat on the ground and and bedding um and i think that uh it was extraordinary how the initiative of just one guy and his friends went and they, they were able to look after a whole community. Um, and even some of the big aid couldn't get through because the roads were impassable. Um, but they did it, they got through and they helped a big community there. You know, so uh, it's, 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 you know, these guys are gonna be looked after over winter, which is the most important thing, you know. Uh, and what is the kind of res response from the Christians that you help uh, that are caught up in um, in the earthquake that not only affects Christians but also affects the entire population as well? And I suppose the worst aspect of this devastating earthquake to actually hit Morocco was the fact this happened in the Atlas Mountains. Mm. And uh, even at the best of times, access to these remote villages are very difficult, but in times of an earthquake, it's almost impossible. Mm. Um, to, so share with us how your ministry has been able to really, really help them uh, and help those Christians that have lost everything because of this earthquake. Well, the same with um, Syria and, and Morocco it's being in the hands of Jesus first and foremost. You know, it's sharing the gospel, it's sharing love, you know, before we then talk to them about anything else. It's just showing that we care, 
um, and that there's people out there that love them and there's a God that loves them. And, um, you know, they, they go about this with just the amazing um, humility and dedication, you know, to, to build these camps to help people uh, survive. And that's what they're doing, they're surviving. There was a picture there of a, it was one of my favourites actually, it was a woman standing at the front of the tent looking out and, it, and the weather looked fantastic, you know, but she was standing there with her baby. And I always thought, what is going through her mind? She's got an out, her home's been devastated, it's destroyed. And she has now got to have her home there in this tent throughout winter with her baby. And um, so yeah, it conjures up this, um, this uh, compassion in you and it's the compassion of the guys that drove all this, t all this time you know to really help this community out and, and they had to walk quite a way as well to actually start putting up these tents and uh, it's part of what we do and it's a part of spreading the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ wherever, we, wherever it's needed. And uh, moving on to um, your great initiative that helped the persecuted you have called uh, Seeds of Hope. Now, you know, I've done a program with you in the summer and mm. last year we touched on this one as well. The kind of total political and economic devastation that we're seeing in Lebanon today mm. uh, and, and how that you're offering hope uh, with uh, Seeds of Hope and all the wonderful projects that you have in Lebanon, particularly the uh, incredible farm. But also the fact that uh, sadly, uh, you know, the Lebanon used to be described as the Switzerland of the Middle East, primarily because of its beautiful mountains, but also yeah. the, it attracted so many um, Arab bankers from the Gulf. Mm. And now today, its uh, rich culture and heritage has been completely devastated by political mismanagement, corruption, um, the inf Iranian influence there, and of course, you know, Hezbollah on, uh, on its southern border there posing a threat to Israel that can actually inflame the situation in the Middle East any time, particularly since uh, October the 7th makes this even more likely. But just um, unpack for us the incredible work you guys are doing in Lebanon um, with this really exciting project known as Seeds of Hope. Yes, uh, certainly. Well, uh, Seeds of Hope is a miracle. You know, with the crisis again in uh, Lebanon, who've had that uh, horrendous um, port explosion, uh, then COVID and then uh, the devaluation of the lira, the Lebanese lira above about 400%. People are starving. You know, they can't even heat their homes uh, because it's too expensive. Um, so we, um, we prayed about this and the Lord showed us a piece of land uh, which we were able to build um, about 11 huge, great big polytunnels on, or greenhouses as they call them, but they're huge, they're massive. And uh, I was up there last year and we fed 450 meals to the local community of Muslims and Druze, which is a miracle in itself. You know, so the community were helping to feed uh, physically and both spiritually. Um, and so going on from that, these, uh, the fruit and veg now fills 35 truckloads, which we take down into Beirut. And um, we work with local churches and uh, we ask them to identify the, the vulnerable, the, um, the hungry, you know, the starving. And then they can come to uh, a place at a particular time and actually pick up fruit and vegetables as much as they need. We also have people coming and taking the fruit and vegetables to the people that can't get out of their homes. And this is an amazing outreach. It's again, it's an outreach via the churches down in Beirut. And we witnessed it, Marika and I witnessed it, um, as you'll see on the photographs, this September, uh, where people were coming down and they were just so grateful. Uh, they couldn't afford this food if they went out to the shops. So it's feeding the hungry, the lost, and bringing them to Jesus, which is the most important thing. Amen. So we can see uh, from on the screen there some beautiful um, pictures of being able to help those uh, poor people in Lebanon. So let's have a look at uh, the initiative that is known as uh, Seeds for Hope. As winter kicks in and the people of Lebanon continue to feel the bite of the economic crisis, Help the Persecuted is feeding thousands of people in desperate need, both physically and spiritually. In April this year, the charity opened this three-acre farm called Seeds of Hope that now distributes up to 39 truckloads of produce each month. 
The farm is run by local pastor Amal, who explains why these food supplies are so vital, particularly for persecuted Christian converts, who are often the last to receive any kind of humanitarian aid. In fact, here in Lebanon, because of the economic collapsing, all the people they are in need, especially the persecuted people, they don't have the vegetable to eat. The vegetables are very expensive now. Uh, and also, uh, there is disease called uh, cholera because of the vegetables. Some farms, they use the unclean water to uh, watering the plants. So in our project, we, we use the well uh, water from the well. It's very clean water. He went on to explain how this feeding ministry also serves as a bridge to reach the Muslim community, including through their regular community meals. This project is kind of building bridges between the community and make relationship with the people. Uh, and have also the Muslim, they, they begin to say, because in Islamic way, it's forbidden to, lo uh, it's forbidden to love the non-Muslim. You cannot love them. They f uh, find that this is a strange project because we are helping lots of people. Sometimes, yes, of course, we are focusing on the uh, persecuted people, but sometimes we help some vulnerable uh, Muslim also. And of course, we use the distributing vegetables to uh, preach the gospel for them, to give them the message of the gospel. Help the persecuted CEO, Joshua Youssef, is inspired by the spiritual impact this project is having as they look at the whole person. They are physically hungry. We know they're spiritually hungry, but they're physically hungry. And in that point, we meet them at their point of need, and we're able to build that currency to share the gospel with them. And so what we're seeing is the Lord is opening the spiritual eyes of Druze, Muslims, uh, some Christians who may have born, been born into an ethnic Christian home but don't know or have a relationship with Jesus. But that's all happening because we're able to, to look at the whole person and help the whole person. And Help the Persecuted is hoping to expand this feeding ministry into many other countries where they work throughout the Middle East. And to find out more, go to htp.org. And it's great to see how uh, Seeds of Hope is really making a huge difference in the lives of, of Christians in, Be in southern Lebanon and also in Beirut and how this is given an opportunity to share the gospel with their Arab neighbours. Uh, what would you describe, Tim, as the political situation in Lebanon? Because we know that, uh, as you mentioned, the devastation from this explosion that occurred in August of 2020, uh, the complete devastation caused by COVID, uh, the devaluation of the Lebanese uh, currency, the lira, the ongoing political instability and, and the way that the Iranian regime uh, uses uh, Lebanon as well, particularly with the huge amounts of weapons and arms that are going into Hezbollah to stoke up tension between Israel and, uh, and Lebanon through their terror proxy, which is Hezbollah. Well, it's interesting when you uh, fly into Beirut, you actually fly into Hezbollah territory and so coming out of Be Beirut uh, airport into Beirut city centre, you're travelling right through Hezbollah country. You know, so depending on what time you're going in, it could be quite dicey, you know, especially if they put up a roadblock. But going back to your question, um, I think over the years, um, you know, people have suffered greatly and it's always the people that suffer for these wars, you know, through politics and proxy wars and um, and I think at the moment with this war with Hamas, um, we have taken um, a very good big view of the fact that it's going to um, uh, escalate. Uh, you've got about 150,000 uh, Hezbollah armed troops, you know, in Lebanon as we speak, as you know, ready to fire thousands of rockets over. Um, so we partnered with a church up in uh, the hills above Beirut and we took on a building right next to it uh, and we kitted that out to take in about 30 to 35 people, uh, mainly families um, and those that are fleeing from the south. Um, so we've taken this on for a year, you know, we're not quite sure how it's going to escalate. Our first family is the family that had to escape Iran through persecution and ended up in southern Lebanon. 
And of course, with Hezbollah and Israel fighting, they were right in the middle of the rockets. You know, so they had to flee. Um, and that was our first family. Our second family is a, is a lady. Exactly the same thing happened with her two daughters uh, in southern Lebanon, you know, in the middle of the rockets, going backwards and forwards. And so she had to flee for her, for her life up into the north. So um, that's our second family. We've got, I think, three or four families in there at the moment. Um, we can take more people uh, if we have to and put mattresses on the floor. Um, but once it's got full, um, we are also looking for other buildings to house them in. Um, they're going to need food. You know, if a war starts, food becomes scarce. And so we're doubling the size of our Seeds of Hope farm, the right. piece to know. And the land is already being cultivated as we speak. Um, so that will, you know, provide a huge amount more food for these people. They need, um, they need trauma counselling. They need love. They need fellowship. Um, and they just need uh, to be looked after. And they need to be connected with the church. So that's what we do as well, um, to be discipled. Um, and then on the long-term strategy, um, if this goes on for, you know, the war goes on for a long time, people are going to need to have jobs. And we have an enduring livelihood program um, where we help persecuted Christians uh, get a business. So we give them, you know, help them get a, um, you know, um, a business plan together uh, for an idea that they want, or they may have had a business before. Um, they just had to lose that because they had to flee and they've lost everything. And so we give them a helping hand up. So if they can support themselves for six months, then they're on their own. But out of the 78%, um, sorry, out of all of the businesses that we've started, over 78% are still running, uh, which means to say they are not only sustaining their own livelihood, but they're also taking on more people themselves. Uh, so this is kind of a long-term view we're taking uh, in Lebanon where we can do it. It's more difficult in other countries, but uh, we're just going to see how this pans out. But uh, at the moment, as you know, um, the situation with Israel and Hamas, Israel, Hezbollah, um, and then, you know, with uh, proxy wars being fought in Syria, then it's not looking that great. Um, so we're just getting prepared. So let's uh, remind ourselves of the horrors that occurred on Saturday, the 7th of October, when Hamas carried out the biggest mass terrorist attack in Israel's history and the biggest genocide against uh, J Jewish people since the Holocaust. Well, this weekend, CBN News gained access to one of the Israeli communities targeted in the initial attacks from Gaza. CBN's Chuck Holton went to see firsthand the destruction of this once peaceful farming community. Children's toys lie scattered in the midst of shell casings and burned out cars. The smell of death lingers in the air, a pungent reminder of the hellish attack just over a week ago. Colonel Golan Vash gave a tour of the village, describing what he found when his team first arrived, only hours after the area had been retaken from the terrorists. We found a family outside, exactly where you're standing right now. But it was only the beginning of what we saw inside. In this corner of this living room, we find a concentration of eight babies burned among 15 other people. They came in here and slaughtered about 10% of the residents of this kibbutz. These are children, old people, and you can just see the incredible destruction that was wrought here. And the last terrorist was cleared out of this kibbutz a week after the initial attack. So their plan was to use it as a bargaining chip and to take everyone hostage here. Instead, they got an incredible battle as soldiers from the IDF came in and killed all of the terrorists. I think that some of the terrorists who come hiding in the houses, for example, here, wait silently in a high readiness for 12 hours or 16 hours, and then they get up. So every time that we saw that we cleaned the area and everything was silent, suddenly another 12 or another 20 got out. out yeah. 
When the village was finally cleared, rescuers turned to recovery, and what they found will stay with them for the rest of their lives. I found a mother lying, protecting her baby, and she was shot in the back, and the baby was beheaded. You've been all over the world. You, you respond to rescues and crises. Describe how this compares to what you've seen around the world. Nothing compared to that. If we needed any, anything to, to convince us, we cannot use the same democratic tools that the world use. It's not the human rights that you in your mind think of. Right now, there is no place for feeling. We are professionals. We need to achieve our goals, and our goal is to ensure that the Hamas um, organization is no longer exist. This is what we're talking about here. You see these pictures of people with their babies, their children, that just wanted to live a peaceful life. And on the 7th of October, that peace was shattered. And now their home looks like this. All this region, we must clear from this kind of threat. If we want to provide our citizens the security, the protection that we could not give them last Saturday. The battle to retake Be'eri may be over, but the war is just beginning. And as these IDF troops marshal their forces within sight of the massacre, every one of them knows exactly what they're fighting for. From Southern Israel, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, it, tensions are rising very high in the Middle East uh, because of Hamas's horrific terrorist attack on Israel and, of, of course, Israel's response to that attack by trying to destroy uh, Hamas, but also that ever-looming threat that, has, that Hezbollah pose to Israel is also a very worrying concern. Um, Tim, also out, out of this, which is uh, kind of a, a strange development of happening, and particularly as you know that uh, the Middle East is the birthplace of Christianity, mm -hmm. our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. And as a response of uh, what's happening in Gaza, we see that not only is the Palestinian Authority, but also a Jordan, um, and also the birthplace of Jesus, Bethlehem this year, have decided to actually cancel uh, Christmas to show solidarity uh, with those um, in Gaza. Um, just share with us um, what impact this will have on the uh, Christian communities in those countries not being able to celebrate Christmas this year. Well, I think it's a very sad decision. You know, I mean, you know, Christmas time is the as you say, it's the, it's the birthplace of, of Jesus, and it's the only time of year that everyone can come together and celebrate what it really means. Um, but I think, you know, also on the plus side, um, Christmas has become so commercialized, you know, with flashing Santas, you know, and lights, and, and the meaning of Christmas has been diluted and taken away in some respects. And so looking at these news reports, they are saying that we're going to concentrate on services, you know, uh, to discover the real meaning of Christmas. And I hope that this is a real turning point in the Middle East where people will focus on what it means that it, this is the birth of Jesus. Who is he? You know, start asking questions because a lot of the glitter and glam and all that stuff has been taken out of it. Absolutely. So I hope, hopefully people can then focus on the reality of Christmas and the birth of our, G our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So let's look at this excellent uh, CBN news report that reports on how Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus Christ and the birthplace of Christianity in the Middle East, has cancelled Christmas this year. Manger Square in Bethlehem is empty now and Christmas won't be celebrated as usual in the birthplace of Jesus. The Bethlehem municipality announced traditional Christmas decorations in Manger Square will not be put up to show solidarity with those suffering in Gaza, the first time Christmas has been canceled in Bethlehem since 1988. The underlying sentiment is this. They are trying to set a point in the community that even though Bethlehem, the Christians in Bethlehem are not involved in the battle in Gaza, 
what they what they feel is that as Bethlehemites, they don't want to come across as insensitive to the suffering of the Gaza civilians. Pastor Stephen Corey is the founder of Holy Land Missions in Bethlehem. I don't think Christmas should be canceled. They say they're not canceling Christmas, they're canceling the festivity of it, the, the lights, the decorations, and so forth. But uh, uh, really, that's the joyful part of Christmas from, from the outwardly uh, sort of day-to-day -day thing. And so if they want to uh, not uh, do the light celebrations, that's fine. Um, I, I don't like it, but it's a decision. They're not holding us back from doing prayer services and doing a Christian religious service. They're not holding us back or stopping us from doing that. A Facebook post from the municipality did say they wanted to show solidarity with Hamas. Pastor Khoury is looking to redeem the situation and the season. So here's what we're doing. Where we're telling people is let the lights go out, but let the light of Christ shine. Let the decorations be taken down, but let the symbol of Christ's promise be heard and stand. What we're doing in the month of December and probably till the early January is we're going to set up a tent. The tent will introduce people to the nativity. We're going to call it the Nativity Encounter Christmas Tent, the Hope Tent. This Nativity Encounter Tent is we're going to get people to walk through this tent, Chris, and, and, and it's a Bible discovery experience. Where people can feel, touch, something dealing with what it would, would have been looked like during Christ's days in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. And they walk out the other side getting the message that the miracle has happened here. Later, Corey is planning a more permanent encounter center in Bethlehem. This year, he wants to keep Christmas centered on Jesus. And we are bringing it back to ground zero. And that the Christmas is he's about Jesus. He's the reason for this season. And that's what we're planning to do throughout Christmas. And we invite the world to pray, to stand, and to come volunteer with us at this tent. Paul Strand, CBN News, Jerusalem. And uh, tragic that uh, Christmas has uh, been cancelled in Bethlehem, um, also uh, in Jordan as well, and throughout the Palestinian Authority. Um, but we know that the true light of Christmas is the good news of the gospel, and that's uh, Yeshua Hamashiach, and no one can cancel him, and no one can turn his lights out. And um, Tim, Amen. just share with us a little bit about your re uh, winter relief, uh, 2023. Uh, you've been able, you want to help over 17,225 people mm -hmm. uh, from Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan. Uh, uh, share with us this very ambitious, but also an amazing project. Well, each year we, we do a winter relief, you know, and each year it's growing. And you say we've got 10 countries there that uh, we're supporting through our church partners, um, families, the elderly, children. Um, and again, it's showing the love of Jesus at this time of Christmas. And amen to that, his light won't go out, you know. Um, so it's anything from, you know, children's clothing to children's shoes, uh, fuel, um, uh, food, we, we've got our emergency relief boxes, we call them food baskets, you know, they've got enough food in there to sustain a, a family of four for a whole month to compensate what they're already having. Um, uh, we've got biblical material, uh, there's going to be a whole host of things, as you can imagine. And s over 17,000 people are going to benefit, which is our largest so far across these 10 countries. Uh, and, and Tim, share with our, uh, our viewers who are watching this program with only a few days to go before Christmas, the importance of remembering um, our brothers and sisters uh, in Christ who are in the Middle East, who are part of the persecuted church um, as we celebrate Christmas and how our viewers can get involved and support the ministry that is help the persecuted. Absolutely. Well, a lot of these people that we're going to be helping don't know really the gospel. They don't know who Jesus is. Uh, so we just pray that through this outreach, through this winter relief program, that the news and the, and the gospel of Jesus Christ at Christmas will touch so many hearts, you know, in these, in these, these countries that are, are stricken with war and, and earthquakes, um, and they're starving. Um, supporting them is a command of Jesus Christ. You know, so he says that if you look after these, you're looking after me. And one of my favorite verses is where Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
so encouraging from the words of our Lord and Saviour. Um, but yeah, so this is how they can support the persecuted church uh, this Christmas. Uh, they can go onto our website, www.htp, uh, that's help the persecuted, htp.org.org. Um, and any donation that's made during um, December will be doubled. So that is a huge incentive. Um, and uh, we'll, it will help to fund all the projects that we're doing, you know, these important work like the Seeds of Hope Farm, the Earthquake Response, the Winter Relief, you know, so please help out. But prayer is also important. It's such a powerful tool to pray for the persecuted. But, but show us the, the impact of, uh, of these Christians when you're able to help and assist them. Just, just show us how um, that they then feel that they're really not alone and there are Christians in the West who are praying for them, supporting them practically, but also showing them the love of Jesus Christ, that they're not alone under the midst of such suffering, persecution and evil that they have to face. Well, so many families all over uh, feel lonely at Christmas. And you can imagine that you know, the persecuted Christians have lost their whole family. You know, they have gained another one in the body of Christ, but they've lost their main family. You know, so, so it's so important and it's so encouraging for them uh, to pray for them. And that's what they experience. Uh, Tim, I just want to thank you so much for being my special guest on uh, this week's Middle East Report and happy Christmas to you. And uh, I just want to thank you for watching this program at home. I just want to wish you a very happy Christmas and a happy new year. But it's also important that we remember the persecuted Christians in the Middle East who face incredible persecution, suffering with earthquakes and wars. And so therefore it's imperative that we reach out uh, to these Christians, particularly at Christmas, so they feel that they're not alone and uh, that they are loved, uh, particularly from the West, and they're not forgotten because this is the true church that is emerging now in the heart of the Middle East. So I want to thank you for watching this Christmas edition of the Middle East Report.